This is Mark James Montero. I'm a student of Bachelor of Science in Information Technology and this project video is for my subject Integrative Programming and Technology 1. So the topic that I choose is uh, group number one which is uh, compiled versus uh, interpreted languages and then integrative coding and intelligent storage system. So uh, first uh, compiled versus interpreted languages. So so what is a compiled or what is a compiler or when do you, you when do you a uh, language is when do the language is compiled? So think about this programming language, right? Uh, we have so many programming languages like uh, we have C, we, we have uh, C++, Python, Java. Now, uh, when it comes to C and C++, they are compiled language, right? Uh, because uh, you as a programmer, you have to write uh, C programming, right? Now, this is, uh, these are high languages, which simply means your machine cannot understand these languages because by default, a uh, computer works only on a machine or machine language uh, which which is whether you format basically so that means when you write the code which is a C language you have to convert that uh, code into a machine language and that's where compiler comes to the picture uh, so C, so your C code gets uh, compiled to give you the machine code. The same goes f for other languages as well. So that's why uh, we say it's a compiled language now. Uh, compiler don't just uh, a way of converting a high language level or high level language into a machine language. Some sometimes you also uh, convert a language from A to B. Now uh, A can be many language and B can be many language provide, provided there's a way to convert that. Uh, so a compiler can convert any language. So from any language, you cannot simply say from high to low. It can be uh, from high to high as well. Uh, that's basic term which we use on a compiler right next is uh, interpreted simply so interpreted simply means you have to a set of instruction and your interpreted will read each and every line one by one so on line one line two line three line four line five and it will start executing everything line by line and that's why it is interpreted language so now uh, what happened is your bytecode is interpreted but then why uh, why we do why do we have to make it so complex of having comparison f first and then going for interpretation for one reason so we use a concept of bytecode to achieve portability. So now what is a portability? Uh, here, uh, so we have this term, right? Uh, which is a platform independence that you can write a code once and you run on different platform. For example, as your machine changes, your CPU architecture also changes, right? So if you're reading a code for one machine and if you compiling it to get a binary file or a native code it may it may work on some other machines because a machine may have different CPU architecture and to solve this problem we have the concept of virtual machine so in this uh, virtual machine what you run is a byte code okay and this bytecode will run on the virtual machine and that will convert into native code. That simply means any machine or 
doesn't matter what's uh, your CPU architecture using. So if your uh, machine has a VM software or, uh, or the virtual machine software, you're good to go. So uh, the moment I say virtual machine, are you thinking about uh, VMware or something? So not exactly. Uh, we are not trying to copy a physical hardware. So this virtual machine, which I'm talking, is uh, very specific to the programming language. So for example, for Python, we have PBM or Python Virtual Machine. So the same concept is there in the Java as well, which is the JVM or Java Virtual Machine. Okay, so uh, next topic will be uh, design pattern or uh, integrative coding or design pattern. So what what are the design uh, patterns? So design patterns are evolved as reusable solution to the problem that we encounter in everyday pro of the everyday programming. So in many inter in many uh, interviews, uh, you might have encountered a lot of questions about interfaces, abstract classes, delegates, and other features related to object-oriented programming along with uh, design pattern related questions. So design pattern uh, solution are evolved from the uh, features of object-oriented programming once you understand the design pattern it makes you very comfortable attending any interviews as well as it helps you in applying these features in projects or or application we should we should note that point so uh, implementing design pattern in the application are proven and tested writing the code aligning with design patterns will make your application reliable scalable easy to maintain now let's understand what are the design patterns so design patterns are reusable solution to to the problem that we encountered in day-to-day -day programming they are generally targeted at solving the problems of the of object generation and integration so in other words uh, design patterns act as a template which can be applied to uh, the real world programming problems uh, these generalized patterns act as a templates that can be applied to real real world problems uh, let's talk about the history and evolution of the design patterns the the four, uh, the four author of the book Element of Reusable Object-Oriented Software are referred to Gang of Four. Okay, so so Gang of Four are ones who brought the concept of design pattern in their books Element of Reusable Object-Oriented uh, Software. So Gang of Four. Gang of Four has uh, divided into two parts with first part explaining about the pros and cons of object-oriented programming and the second part explain the evolution of 23 classic software design patterns. Uh, so the first publication, so the first publication date of the book was during the end of year 1994. For more info, uh, Please refer to the list of Wikipedia article below. Okay. So now let's understand the type of design patterns. So Gangnam 4 have created the design patterns into three uh, types based on, of, on different problem encountered in the real world or real time application. They are creational. They are uh, creation, creational structural and behavioral design pattern uh, let's talk about a creational design pattern so creational uh, design pattern this type uh, deals with object creation and initiations 
So this uh, pattern gives the program more uh, flexible or more flexibility in deciding which object needs to be created for a given case. Singleton, factory, abstract, etc. And so these are some of the creational design pattern. Second type of uh, design pattern is structural or structural design pattern. So uh, post-creational uh, design pattern. So structural design pattern, this type deals with class and object composition. In simple word, uh, this pattern focuses on decoupling interfaces, implementation of classes and its objects. Adapter, facade, and bridges are some of the example of structural design pattern. So now that you know how to create a structural object and classes, we need to understand how we control the behavior of these objects. So behavioral design patterns deals with the communication between classes and objects, chain of responsibility, command, and interpreter are some of the example of behavioral pattern. So uh, it is very important to have a basic knowledge about the object-oriented concept like abstraction, inheritance, polymorphism, and encapsulation. So interfaces, classes, and abstract classes. So these are the most important part of the design pattern. Okay, so uh, intelligent storage system. So this will be our next topic. So uh, example of intelligence, uh, intelligent storage system is the VNX. So what makes it, uh, what makes it intelligent? What do you think? So I think it's uh, software. Software makes everything intelligent, right? So, but there's also some other components that are the key elements in understanding what uh, what an intelligent storage system really provides as things like a backend that's your connectivity between SPs and your disk themselves that is considered the quote unquote uh, backend that uh, that is the SAS bus interconnection between those two your front end is really what your hosts are connect connecting to over your over your network either over your you know your IP network your internet network or fiber channel network and those foreign important can consider of fiber channel port you know 8 gig highest case common nowadays could be a copper you know your uh, internet ports you've you've got a couple different option even 10 gig and they are all coming in across those front end ports because they talk uh, data center protocols such as fiber channel fcoe and then they're hitting cache directly which is really the next component of this so data that is written to the front end usually hits the cache first and then an acknowledgement is sent back to the host itself the another major component of the intelligent storage system is the disk so back in this so uh, all four of these together with the software kind of automation steering and managing all this is what makes up an intelligent storage system. 